This AP free response question is going to look at a glider on an air track that's connected to a spring. And the spring is going to be stretched out and then the glider is going to be released. And so you have energy that's stored in the spring that turns into kinetic energy of the glider. And the glider passes through the photo gate which is recording how fast the glider moves. And it's able to do that by, if you know the width of the small flag on top of the glider and how much time it takes for that flag to pass through the photo gate, you can use that to estimate the instantaneous velocity. And so this type of problem is one that is some basic ideas with conservation of energy, but it's also a lab-based question. This is the type of question where they give you data and they ask you to analyze the data. It allows you to use the relationship that you know and the data that you're given to go through, make a graph, and solve for a given quantity. So we have a spring, and the spring has a spring constant or force constant of 40 newtons per meter. And in the data table, we're given how far the spring is stretched and what the speed of the glider is when it passes through the photo gate. We're also given that distance squared and the speed squared, which we're going to see why we might want those values in a second. So the first question is, assuming that no energy is lost, write the equation for the conservation of mechanical energy that would apply to the situation. So in this problem, at the beginning, you have the glider that's pulled backwards, which stretches the spring out. And so at the beginning, you have potential energy that's stored in the spring. And then as it's released, that potential energy is getting turned into kinetic energy. And so the equation for conservation of mechanical energy is that the potential energy at one point plus the kinetic energy at that same point has to equal the potential energy at some other point plus the kinetic energy at some other point. Again, this is if there are no non-conservative forces doing work, then we know that the mechanical energy which is the potential energy plus the kinetic energy, we know that that mechanical energy will stay constant. So at the beginning, we only have potential energy, and more specifically, we have spring potential energy. So potential energy of a spring is one half times the spring constant K times the distance that the spring is compressed squared. Right? In this case, the spring is stretched. So it X is the distance it's stretched or compressed. At the beginning, the glider is released from rest, so there's no kinetic energy. And then when the glider is released, eventually the spring goes back to its unstretched length. And at that point, the string goes slack, and the glider just continues with a constant velocity. And so when it passes through the photo gate, that has happened. And so at the end, when it's going through the photo gate, there's no potential energy stored in the spring and we only have kinetic energy of the glider. That's one half times the mass times the speed squared. And again, we're given the spring constant was 40 newtons per meter. So I have one half times 40 newtons per meter times x squared equals one half times the unknown mass of the glider, which we're going to be looking at, looking for in a second, times the speed squared. And this is the relationship that applies to this situation. The potential energy that's stored in the spring at the beginning equals the kinetic energy that's, that the glider has at the end. And this is the relationship that we're going to be looking at. This is why we're going to be graphing the velocity squared and the position squared because this relationship, it relates the squares of both of those quantities. Again, this is a very common thing um, to have to do on these types of lab-based questions. You're going to take some given relationship and you're going to look at some quantities in that relationship that you're given data for and you're going to figure out how to graph them in, in order to get a straight line to be able to calculate the slope of the line and use that slope to calculate some other quantity. So if we look at this, it says on the grid below plot the 
the velocity squared versus the position squared. So I'm going to go through and do that. So they want velocity squared on the y-axis, they want position squared on the x-axis, and they want the axes labeled with the units and the scale. So here the data is graphed. Again, the velocity squared is on the y-axis. The units of that are meters squared over seconds squared. On the horizontal axis, we have x squared, which is in square meters. And to make this easier, since all of the values were given times 10 to the negative 2 square meters, um, I just used the values. And then underneath, I put that all values are times 10 to the negative 2. So that way, I didn't have to put 0 0.05 times 10 to the negative 2, 1 times 10 to the negative 2. It's given that all of those values, all of the numbers on that scale, are times 10 to the negative 2 on that axis. I also drew the best fit line through the data. Again, this data is approximately linear, but just like normal experimental data, not all of the points will line up perfectly along the line. And so for a best fit line, you want to have it as close to all the points as possible, but you want to have some points above the line and some points below the line, and you're trying to minimize the distance between those points and the line. The next thing that we're looking at is using the best fit line to obtain the mass of the glider. So we had the relationship 1 half times 40 newtons per meter times x squared equaled 1 half times the unknown mass of the glider times v squared. And so we graphed velocity squared versus x squared. We graphed velocity squared on the y-axis and the distance that the spring was stretched, x squared, on the horizontal axis. So I'm going to rearrange this equation and get it into a form of y equals mx plus b. And so the first thing I can do is I can multiply both sides by 2, and then I'm going to divide both sides by m. And I'm going to switch this around since v squared was on my y-axis. I'm going to put that on the left-hand side of the equal sign. So I have that v squared equals 40 newtons per meter over m times x squared. So now this says that if I have v squared graphed on my y-axis, and I have x squared graphed on my x-axis. This is in the form of y equals mx plus b. This quantity, 40 over the mass, is the slope. So y equals the slope times x plus b. We have no y-intercept. And so I need to calculate the slope of my best fit line. And then that slope is going to equal 40 over the mass. When you go to calculate the slope of your best fit line, you need to use two points that are on the best fit line and not use data points. If you look at this, most of my data points aren't actually on my best fit line. And so I have to look for two spots where it crosses, where my best fit line crosses right through a corner to make the numbers easy to read. If you know how to use the graphing feature of your calculator to graph a set of data and use a linear regression, this is also an acceptable method. But for this, I would do the change in my y values, which are my velocity squared values. I get 4.9 minus 2, so that's 2.9 meters squared per second squared. And then I subtract off my values on the x-axis, the x squared values. So that's 2.5 times 10 to the negative 2 minus 1 times 10 to the negative 2. Don't forget to include that those were all times 10 to the negative 2 along the horizontal axis. And so that gives me 0 0.015 square meters. And doing that division, I get 193.33, and then this is seconds to the negative 2, uh, meter squared per second squared, divided by meter squared, just gives me 1 over seconds squared. So now I'm going to use that slope, and I'm going to find my mass. And so we found that the slope was 40 newtons per meter divided by the mass. That's what we had from our equation. We used a relationship between velocity squared values and x squared values that we got from the conservation of energy equation.
and we get that our slope has to be 40 over m. So if I go to calculate this, I have 193.33 seconds to the negative 2 equals 40 newtons per meter divided by the mass, or the mass is going to be 40 divided by 193.33, which gives me 0 0.2069 kilograms. Again, it's newton second squared per meter, which is kilograms. Now we're looking at a similar situation, but now the track is tilted at an angle theta. And when the spring is unstretched, the center of the glider is a height h above the photogate. So in that picture where that glider is shown, that's before you stretch out the spring. And then we stretch it out, and that's this dotted picture. This is the glider when the spring is actually stretched out. Assuming that no energy is lost, write the new equation for conservation of mechanical energy that would apply to this situation. So now we don't just have spring potential energy. We have to look at spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy. So at the beginning, I have both spring potential energy and gravitational potential energy. At the end, I have spring potential energy and I have gravitational potential energy, but I'm going to set this up so that both the spring potential energy and the gravitational potential energy, when it's passing through the photogate, those are both zero. So one last thing that I have to remember is that when it's starting, there's this extra height that I need to include. So drawing this out, if it's stretched a distance x, and this is theta, then this extra height here is going to be x times the sine of theta. So my total height is going to be h plus x sine theta. So I'm going to need to use that as I'm looking at my gravitational potential energy. So my spring potential energy, I still have 1 half times the spring constant k, which was 40 newtons per meter, times x squared, plus the mass times g times my height, which is h plus x sine theta. And then I have zero kinetic energy at the beginning. And at the end, I have zero spring potential energy and zero gravitational potential energy. And then my kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. And then looking at this relationship, our other part is, is this graph of v squared versus x squared, is that going to be a straight line? And our answer is going to be that no, it's not. And the reason for that is we have this term right here that has x in it. So we have something times v squared. It's not just proportional to x squared, which is what we had before. We have that v squared is proportional to x and x squared. And so that's not going to be a straight line relationship. If I tried to do v squared versus x squared, then that x term is going to cause it to curve. So this is not going to be a straight line relationship. Again, this problem is a good problem because it involves some basic conservation of energy ideas. It's a fairly straightforward problem, but it's also a problem that teaches you how to take experimental data how to figure out what you're going to graph on the y-axis, what you're going to graph on the x-axis, and how to use a known equation, a known fundamental equation, to figure out what the slope of that best fit line is going to give you. In these lab type questions, this is a very common skill to need to use, and that's to use the slope of a best fit line to calculate some unknown quantity
And so you're going to look at what the given relationship is and use that relationship to figure out how your slope is related to some unknown quantity. 